Hi, thanks. Uh, first time I've been at the big room before, so hope I live up to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're cool. Great, uh, so, oh, can everybody hear me in back? Yep, great, okay. So I built a thing, uh, it's called Spectrum. Uh, it's static analysis for closure.spec. Uh, so basically you just use spec as normal and then instead of running your generative for tests or instrument or that kind of thing, we'll check your annotations at compile time. So there's a function you use at the REPL and it walks the source code. It's awesome, right? Uh, I got some bad news. <laughs> um, predicates are types, so, you know, if you have the predicate like string, you know, that all, you can convert that to Java Lang string. Spectrum is a static type checker for closure. <laughs> Sorry, Stu. <laughs> so, uh, you can thank Chaz Emmerich for this uh, wonderful meme. <laughs> but don't panic, it's fine. Uh, we're gonna go through why this is okay and maybe not such a terrible idea. So the workflow. Um, you write your normal closure source code, and then you write some more code to prove your code works. Well, we already have that, right? It's called closure.test and test.check and closure.spec, and I can keep naming testing libraries, but the point here is that, you know, we're already used to this workflow of you write some code, and then you write some more code to prove that it works, so this is just one more thing, right? Nothing, nothing special about that. Um, I'm gonna try to approach static typing here from a no dogma perspective. You know, I'm treating this as just one more tool to improve your code quality. You know, you'll hear in the community, oh, I don't believe, You'll never hear somebody say, oh, I don't believe in unit testing, but you'll totally hear them say, I don't, I don't believe in static typing. So we're gonna go through some of the arguments around this. So the current status, uh, it runs. <laughs> uh, it checks basic closure source code, so I have, you know, it has unit tests, and I've written hundreds of little fake namespace definitions and things. It self-checks itself. Um, it has some false positives, but it has caught real bugs. In, in itself, yeah, um, and it's not recommended for real projects yet. Uh, you know, you can download it, you can run it, you can poke around with it at the REPL, but it's, there's still a lot of missing, call it convenience stuff, and there's some specs that'll check and some that won't, so. Uh, I'll do some polling the audience research here. Uh, so raise your hand if you've ever written production code in a conventional statically typed language. That's nearly everybody. Okay, uh, closure, another dynamic language. Again, nearly everybody. Um, now we get to the fun ones. Scala or Haskell, or another strict language. Okay, so that's maybe 20% of the room at best. And then schema or spec. That's, you know, 30% of the room. And then the fun one, core type, spectrum, TypeScript, or another optional static type language, like nobody, so, you know, 5%. So we have all these opinions about, oh, static typing is great, static typing is terrible, and when you apply, when you try to apply that argument to closure, you know, obviously we don't have much data. Oh, fun one, you ship bugs to production. That's, <laughs> I've definitely done that. Um, so notice that we have, you know, Arguments for and against, and yet everybody is still breaking production. And they will continue with Spectrum. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying this will fix every problem, or even many problems. So why did I do this? To prove Hacker News wrong. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you may, be, you may be familiar with the uh, blog post why CircleCI is no longer supporting, or no longer using core types. Uh, so, I was the one at Circle, I was the one that introduced core typed. I was the one that set up the, or supported Ambrose with the, the original Kickstarter, and, and we used it for a while. Uh, I'm no longer with the company. I'm not, I wasn't there when this decision was made, and I wasn't there when the blog post was written, but I was there for the grumbling about, you know, what did and didn't work, and I agreed with the vast majority of the blog post, and I think Ambrose would agree with it, too. Um, as far as I know, Circle talked to him uh, before they wrote it. But then the Hacker News comments, uh, these are probably too small to read, but so many people got this wrong. Um, the blog post wasn't saying that 
optional static typing can't work. It wasn't saying that, you know, bolting on a type system can't work. It was, it mainly came down to practicality. Um, you know, Circle needed to ship code today. Core type was being worked on, you know, part time by a PhD student. So, like, it's, I have no doubt that it can work. It was just, it, what, it wasn't developed enough at the time. So basically, all of Spectrum is a long reply to Hacker News saying you were wrong. <laughs> um, and, but, but more seriously, I wanted another option for, code, for improving my code quality. So we take a step back, you know, why are, we, why are we here? Why are we at this conference? Why are we using Clojure? Why are you listening to me talk about static typing? Um, so we, we care about making better software faster and cheaper. You know, we, we all know about the NASA techniques, you know, if you really want to, you can write almost perfect code at the cost of you know, $100,000 a line or whatever, but nobody here wants to do that. And honestly, most people here don't need to do that. You know, I don't think anybody here is, right, is launching rockets, so you know, the NASA rules don't really apply to us. So you know, whatever, whatever software you work on, we have this big, messy problem. You know, um, and we have all, all kinds of techniques for trying to solve the problem. So obviously, the first one is thinking. It's, it's a good technique. Um, if you're Feynman, you know, this is your algorithm. This is, um, nobody here is Feynman. So we have all these other, all these other techniques. You know, thinking, we have high-level languages, unit tests, and you can probably come up with another dozen of these. Uh, and kind of like edge cases, you know, or special cases, if you have no edge cases, you, or if you have no special cases, you might, you might be solving the problem correctly. If you have 12 special cases, you're probably not. Um, you know, you can come up with another dozen lit for this. And so it, it tells you each one of these things might help, but none of them is perfect. You know, and part of that reason is our, our source code isn't all the same. You know, you have different functions. You have different kinds of code. You're using different system architectures. So, so not every, you, you don't want to unit test everything. And even the things you can unit test, you don't always want to. You know, so you know, famously, you don't want to unit test a distributed system. Uh, you don't want to unit test anything with races. Uh, you don't want to unit test throwaway code. You don't want to test, unit test prototypes. Um, so every, every technique in that big list doesn't work somewhere. You know, so like Stu has these, uh, tweets these interview questions. You know, think of a time where you, you know, so a fun interview question here would be, for every technique, come up with a situation where you wouldn't want to use it, or where it wouldn't be as effective as some other technique. You know, so code review, you know, the, the, the technical term for code that isn't amenable to code review, you know, you could say it's bad code, uh, but you could also say uh, maybe it's a really gnarly function, and the person there's you know one person who wrote it, and then there's you have junior employees who aren't as experienced in that code base. Uh, generative testing is great; use it in a lot of places. You know, we've seen lots of good talks about how and when it saved people, but then you wouldn't want you wouldn't use it for like, you know, the account settings page in your UI. Uh, you wouldn't use it for you know, I do this state transition, this state transition, and then the final result is this. Um, and then, you know, to be completely fair, static typing doesn't work everywhere. Um, it doesn't work when you eval. Uh, it doesn't work when, I had better, I had lame examples for this, but I guarantee you there are places it doesn't work. Uh, if, you have, if you have gnarly types, you know, so, so one of the things we'll see is you have a uh, messy closure, not closure, uh, not a messy code base, but when you, you build your system without types and then you try to introduce it later, you might end up with a lot more kind of weird types than you would have thought of if you'd done it up front. So just now, we were just talking about how there are different kinds of te quality techniques and they work in, they don't work as well in every situation. But then there's another access to this, which is your, co your code might need more or less quality than my code. You know, what is the cost of making a, a mistake in your software? That's gonna be different from the cost of making a mistake in my software. You know, so, you know, firing rockets into space versus Twitter. Like, 
it, so if you say, you know, if you get on, if you get on Twitter and you say, you know, this is the one true way to write code, it's like, really? You know, who, who are you talking to? Who is your audience? You know, are they, are they firing rockets into space or are they, you know, yo app? You know, the messaging thing that sends yo's to your buddies. Like, so the, the, you always need context when you talk about which advice and, you know, which techniques to use, you know, because aside, aside from how much quality, it's like, well, maybe I'm building a distributed system. Maybe I'm building an internet of, uh, an embedded system. Uh, you know, maybe, yeah. So then, and then on top of that, even in the same project, your correctness requirements will change over time. You know, so like when Circle started, I, we had, when it first launched, we had 20, use, 20 using companies, and probably half of them were startups with no customers either. So, you know, if, if Circle was unreliable, they didn't care. You know, now there are 10,000 companies using it. So then, at some point in the middle, Circle went from complete toy to, if we mess up, lots of people are gonna have a bad day. So then, that's in one project that, you know, one kind of software, it, the quality had to increase over time. So again, with the context, you know, what are you building? It's like, how much quality do you need? How much time, how, what's your quality budget? You know, how much time are you willing to spend on this? Um, and I don't really like the answers of like, oh, well, closure has, or Circle has to be correct now, so you should use, you know, Haskell or Idris or something, you know, some extremely strict language. But then, oh, over here, when you're still in the prototype phase, it's okay to use Ruby. You know, rewriting in the middle is not an acceptable answer for we need to change how much quality, how much correctness we're spending on the product. So you need a tool that can grow with you. Okay, so now what? You know, we still have our messy problem and we have, you know, thinking covers a lot of this, but it's not gonna cover all of it. And then we have all these other techniques. So then, Another circle story. Sorry, this, I think this is the last one. Uh, circle uses containers to run you know, customer code. So we used a thing called LXC, which is you know predates Docker. But you know when I say LXC, you can just imagine Docker because they're based on the same Linux primitives. So we we want to test this. Um, we want to make sure it works. But uh, testing LXC means starting and stopping containers, which means writing to this Linux root device node. So we wanted, you know, we were, we were eating our own dog food and all of, the, all of the circle tests run on circle. So then if you're running the test inside a container, uh, you can't run, you can't hit this root device. Like, okay, so we can't run inside circle. We can't run, oh, and then we couldn't run our Macs because those are Macs versus Linux. So then, you, you know, you don't have a dev LXC node to write to. So this was actually what led us down to using core typed in production because, you know, so like you can write, you can run an emulator, and we did, um, you know. So it's like I'm gonna make, I'm gonna stub the, the expected inputs from this LXC thing, and then, but then you're now you're just testing your emulator because it's like okay, you know, I told you to give me a container, and then you gave me a container, like great, um, and that, that that's not finding new bugs. It's really just regression testing, because. So like one of the fun bugs we found was that uh, LXC was, uh, had race conditions in some, uh, some operations. So if, if one user request comes in and you start making a container and then another one comes in at the same time, the kernel will deadlock and one of your user threads will die. So how do you write a unit test for when I do, when I have a race condition with these series of steps, my thread never returns? Like, what's, what's the unit test for that? What's the generative test for that? You, I mean, you can't do that. So we were looking for more options. Um, so static typing doesn't have to be terrible. Um, a lot of people, when they say, oh, I don't like static typing, what they're, what, a lot of the times they'll say in their head, you know, I don't like Java typing. Um, so let's go through some of the things that can change. So uh, there's a lot of emotional baggage about static typing and, and it's not very, the terms aren't very clear, so it's just, you know, like any good closure talk, we'll define our terms. Um, 
So rather than static and dynamic, let's talk about implicit and explicit. So, uh, you know, closure pre-spec, we would say, is implicit, implicitly typed. Oh, and everything has a type system, you know, because I, one definition I heard I liked was uh, of static typing was the author's expectation of types at runtime. And it's like, well, that's not written down anywhere, so. So we have implicit versus explicit types. You know, Java is explicitly typed because on every single function you say it takes an int and it returns an int, right? And then before, uh, before spec and closure, you would just say, oh, it's a function, and maybe you'd write something in the doc strings. Uh, then another access we have is mandatory versus optional. You know, again, in, in Java, every single, every single function has to be typed. So then I would say it's mandatory that you type everything. Um, and then the third axis is just, is, is, the expre is the type system expressive enough? enough? You know, can I, can I write down the things that I want to, to prove or the things I want to require? Uh, and then finally, a structural versus nominal. So an example of a structural type would be like, in Java I have, you know, the user class, you know, capital U, and it has these fields. So then that, the type of that comes from the fact that it's a Java class with name user, uh, as opposed to like with in spec, uh, when you have S keys, you say this is a map with these keys in it. So then any map that happens to have those keys in it is now uh, de facto a user. So the closure version there is structural typing because you're looking at the contents of the thing to decide what type it is. Um, and as I said, everything has a type system. It's just whether you wrote it down. You know, you can, you know, imagine you're interpreting a closure program in your head. You know, there are types there. It's like this function sometimes takes an int and sometimes takes a string. Well, it's just now we can express it with, with spec. So continuing with the, um, the arguments against static typing. Um, so compiling often complex performance and correctness. You know, so people say, oh, I, I want a compiled static language. And there's kind of two different concerns there. One is I want a fast language, and the other is I want correct code. But, you know, if you don't have to use, you don't have to use types when compiling, right? We can, we can compile code that's just, you know, function takes an object and returns an object. That's what Java, or that's what Clojure does by default, um, you know? Technically, it's compiled. We omitted bytecode, you know. <laughs> Technically correct. Uh, of course, that's not what people often mean, because when they say, I want fast code, you know, typically when they say I want compiled code, they mean I want fast code, and it's just two or three orders of magnitude easier to, to, to omit bytecode with the types in it, so then you avoid the, you know, the runtime check of, oh, is this object a string? Okay, then I can call this method on it. So if we, if we compile the code with type tags, it gets, it's, it's significantly easier. Now, of course, now we have you know, VM, or, uh, V8 and uh, the JVM, but writing those things to get them to this speed was, you know, man decades, probably. So now that we've, all right. So the, the point I want to make there is that um, we can separate these things, and we can think about performance versus correctness and which things you actually want, and why are we doing this? So I'm gonna make the di probably directionally true, but not 100% statement, that Java's type system is more concerned with performance than correctness, and that Java's type system exists to make Java run fast. They're not, they're, and they're more concerned about making Java code fast than about ensuring the correctness of your programs. So when you think about, oh, I want a statically compiled language you know, for code correctness, you're probably not getting that right now. Um, as we all know, Java's type system isn't very expressive, and then, of course, it's mandatory. Like, if, if you saw a language that enforced 100% you know, doc strings on every single function in your code base, like, you'd get grumpy about that, you know? Oh, I have 100% generative testing on everything, even the account settings page on the UI. Like, that's kind of silly. So, of course, when you get to that with, you know, with your type system, oh, oh static, static types are making my code more correct, but you're stuck in this situation 
where it's typically not very expressive and you have to use it everywhere. So it's not, not the great, not the best. So let's talk about closure spec. Um, first, I'm gonna be clear, I'm not trashing spec. I think it's good, I think you should use it. Again, you know, consider the context. Um, but I wanna talk about the trade-offs mainly to talk about what Spectrum does differently. So instrument, um, you know, you, it recompiles your functions, you use it at runtime. Uh, it's not recommended for use in production. So then you use it at de development time and test time. It's only as good as your test coverage. Right, so if you have, you write, let's say you write specs everywhere and then your, your unit tests only run half of your code, it's not gonna check the other half that didn't get run. You know, those assertions won't get checked. Uh, it's unlikely you'll ever hit 100% coverage. Um, yeah, just because the vast majority of code bases never get anywhere near 100% coverage in test. Uh, it doesn't check return types <clears throat> and then the, the checking is weaker than generative testing. Uh, so an example of that, we have you know, good old function foo, and we have two, two types, uh, two specs for the same function here. Uh, we can see the top one, uh, foo takes a map and returns a string, and in the second case, it takes a map of keywords that has to have a keyword bar and returns a string. Now, if you're only doing in instrument testing, uh, the first, the first definition will, pa will pass. Uh, the second definition will only get caught if you run generative testing or use spectrum. Uh, and this matters because uh, it allows spec to lie to you. You know, you, you have to run generative testing to get the full, uh, the full strength test. So, you know, if you're shipping specs in your open source libraries, I'd, I'd recommend using generative testing. Uh, generative testing. So then we use it at test time, you know, use it at the REPL, use it at your CI. It's thorough, like, you know, you run a million different things through it, it will catch bugs. One downside is it's slow. Um, you know, you can go from, you know, a, a fast unit test might run in one millisecond, and I, I typically see 30 second tests on a single, on a single simple peer function. Uh, generators can be very hard to write. So let's talk about that. Um, the generators are best when you're testing fast, pure functions. Um, if your functions aren't fast or they aren't pure, you're probably not gonna have as good of time. Um, writing generators is sometimes hard. And some examples of that, um, impure functions, uh, anything with side effects, so database connections, third-party APIs that you don't control, uh, slow I.O. Uh, protocols. So. You know, you say, I, this function will take anything that implements protocol foo. It's like, well, anything that implements protocol foo? Um, you know, so you can, you can, for example, you can have a bug in your generator where you only return things that implement foo and bar, and then you call, you know, you take your instance and then you call, accidentally call a bar method on this object, and it won't catch that. Uh, the other thing it won't catch is that, you know, protocols are designed to be open dispatch. So then if your generator only generates, you know, one or two instances of this thing, you know, you're, you're probably, you're not getting full coverage on everything that can be called with that protocol. Uh, WebDriver, this was a fun thing I hit. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, my current project, I'm doing some uh, Selenium WebDriver. So I had, you know, oh, I'll try spec and I'll, I'll write out all the, uh, I spec all the methods. So I had this thing that's, you know, give it a configuration map of, oh, I want a Chrome instance running on Linux, and then it'll spin up an instance of Selenium of this class. But the problem is, the, uh, when you create an instance of this class, it spawns a, an instance of Google Chrome, and then your generator does that, you know, a million times a second. So, so this was with me hitting Control Q as fast as I could, you know, trying to keep everything under control, and I was like, wait a minute, this is funny. I should take a picture of that. Uh, and then finally, your, the test coverage depends on your generator coverage. So in instrument, when we were looking at instrument, we saw that the, the coverage depends on your unit tests, and in generative testing, the coverage depends on how good your generator is at exercising all of your code. 
Now, again, I'm not saying don't use generative testing. It's good and it's useful in a lot of situations. It's just not the answer for every situation. Um, also, it's also worth pointing out that Haskell you know, popularized generative testing. It's like they have this static, strong static type system and they said, you know what, we need generative testing. So, you know, neither of them is enough and even together they're probably still not enough. Okay, so the spectrum trade-offs and advantages. Uh, it's faster than generative testing. Uh, it has broad coverage. So it'll analyze every branch of your function. It analyzes all return paths, uh, checks all protocols are used correctly. It can be more strict. So it can check Java interop, uh, can check the contents of vars, you know, so we can do alter var root and binding, uh, check the contents of atoms, you know, like swap, and you can write a spec for, you know, this is an atom of a map to a queue or do an int. And contents of core async channels. Oh, so I'll point out, uh, the bottom of three here are speculative. The Java interop stuff works. These three could work. I haven't written the code. Um, map and higher order functions, this does work, and I'll show an example of that. And then a thing I really want to do is uh, translate pre and post conditions into specs and then statically analyze anonymous functions, because right now there's not a convenient way to, to do that in line. Disadvantages, uh, it's viral. So once you start checking, you know, if you say statically analyze this function, every function that you call inside of it must be typed. Uh, I handle that as much as I can, and I try to make it as optional as I can, but if you have something that doesn't have a spec, then it's like, well, the output of this previous function is unknown, and then you passed unknown into the next function. You know, what, what is that gonna do? Um, you know, so I'm gonna try to make that configurable, but at the end of the day, you're not gonna get good results unless everything is typed. And this totally does slow down development time. Um, anybody who says static typing is faster is, that they're not right. Uh, I, I, had, I spent many nights writing Spectrum where the tests were green and I was trying to add new types, or trying to add new specs to the code and wrestling with it. It's like, wait a minute, all my tests are green. Like, what is, how is adding this type going to solve my problem? Um, in some projects and some namespaces, that trade-off is desirable. So one of the great things about optional typing is that you don't have to, you don't have to put it everywhere, and you, you shouldn't put it everywhere. Um, you know, but like with the LXC thing, you know, we can check only that namespace. You know, we couldn't unit test that namespace because we couldn't run that stuff, but this, this gives you an option to put, to make some parts of your code more strict, and that is useful. Uh, the other downside is implementation complexity. Um, a type checker has to know every aspect of the closure semantics. Uh, I, I definitely, uh, I wouldn't say learned new things about how closure worked, but it definitely reinforced some details and, oh, I didn't know that was implemented that way. Uh, so. Writing a type checker was definitely a learning experience. I, I recommend it. <laughs> and then finally, some legal specs are harder to type. So we have foo again. And this, this time it takes in two even numbers and returns an even number, and we're just doing a simple add. Uh, so we can make this type check, but by default it won't, because, you know, of course the spec doesn't know, you know, the properties of even numbers, and it doesn't know that if you add two even numbers, you get an even number back. Um, we can teach it this, but that's something you'd have to teach it. So, now I don't expect this is going to be a problem in the vast majority of the time. You know, I expect, I'm hoping that like 90% of specs that are seen in the wild will check as is, but there will be some small things that will have to be adjusted. So, let's get into how I did this. Uh, so, type checkers aren't that hard. So, it's really, it was a four step process. Um, so, it's conform tools analyzer flow and check. Uh, so conform is a re-implementation of closure.spec. Uh, the difference is spec takes value, conforms values. Conform, or my conform works on literals and specs. So um, I have this function parse spec that turns a closure.spec into, into, I call them spec t's, you know, spec because it's spectrum, sorry for the uh, puns. But, uh, so, you know, can conform, you know, is this an int three that works? But then 
this, the second line, normally you would expect to see you know, a value or a variable, you know, does this variable x conform to specs? Well, we don't have that at, at compile time. At compile time, we have literals and other specs. So then we can say, yes, this int conforms to an int. Um, and the rules for deriving that is not that hard. You know, it's and spec and or spec, and it's, you know, standard, standard logic there. Um, so then that means, you know, I have to know how to parse all of closure.spec. So the second step is a tools analyzer. Uh, thanks to the, everybody who's worked on that, this was a complete lifesaver. Excuse me. So we take the analyze form. You know, so here's just a simple string three. And so, that, you know, he takes any quoted expression and returns data. So here it's, you know, it's saying, oh, we're invoking a function. The function is the var closure.string. Here are the arguments. Here are the arguments passed to the function. And this works on anything. It takes defs, you know, it takes namespace declarations, everything. Uh, and then it, the main thing, the more, the important thing here is this op invoke. You know, there's like 20 op codes or something. Um, if you go to the GitHub, it'll show you all of them. You know, local variables, function parameters, everything. So they're all just closure maps, and it's all just data. So the second step of the process, I'm calling flow. So it just walks the tools analyzer data and attaches new metadata in places that I care about. Uh, importantly, it, it attaches this return spec to every expression. So we, this is the same output, but now we see there's, uh, on the function, there's the spectrum flow fn spec. And then, uh, so that's, we've looked up the spec for string. Um, I've made up specs for most of the closure core stuff until they, the official ones get shipped. And then in the arguments, you know, you can see, oh, that's a constant, so we use this, uh, we use this thing called value three. So that's a, a spec representing a literal value. And then we can see the return expression. The return of the, at the bottom here, the return spec is the result of calling the string function. Result of calling string function returns a predicate, you know, uh, a thing that's string because that's the return value of the function. So then slightly more involved example, you know, function foo takes an int, returns an int. So we take the, we take the input spec, we destructure the function arguments. So now we know that uh, the x in the function parameters vector is an int. Okay, and then we get to the let block. We say, okay, start on the right-hand side. We get to that, that, that inner x on the, the inner x inside the ink. We walk up, walk up the tools analyzer, uh, you know, it's this big nested tree that you can't print when you have a big thing like this. So walk up to that, find the x in the parameter vectors, say, oh, that's an int. So then the lower x is also an int. Okay, ink on an int is an int. So then we assign y uh, to be an int. And then on the, on the lower y, we say, oh, well, walk up until we find a variable that resolves y. Okay, that's in the let block that has, uh, it has a spec of int, so we're gonna return int. Are we follow that? <laughs> um, it's, it sounds annoying, but it, the, the algorithm is actually pretty simple. Uh, so then checking is just walk the tree again and we just call conform on everything. So this is the spec to conform rather than uh, closure.spec conform. So we conform that function, that the inputs to a function conform to their input arguments, and we conform that the, uh, the return value of like a function definition matches the last expression in the body. And then, you know, it's, it's just run conform on all the things. Um, so closure, you know, we use a ton of higher order functions, um, and so I thought that a, a checker that didn't account for higher level function, higher order functions was gonna be not very useful. So we have this, you know, we have map inc range five here. So, you know, take the numbers from zero to five, add one to them. What is the return type of that? Um, so this is my, uh, my, my closure.spec inter, uh, uh, interpretation for what map is gonna look like. Of course, this isn't official, you know, this is just my best guess at it. And it says it takes an argument that's either a function or a keyword, and then it takes uh, zero or more seeks, and then it returns a seek or 
a function. And that's about as good as you can get with the current spec grammar, um, because you don't have logic variables. And, but you know, we have all, we've all used map before, and we know that uh, you know, map takes a function of, in core type notation, this would be map takes a function from x to y, takes a collection of x's, and returns a collection of y's. Um, and then you know that the function has to accept one argument, and you know that the input to the function has to map the type of the collection. We don't really have a good way to express that right now. And we don't have a good way to express the transducer case in core typed either. So a solution for that, I've been calling them transformers. Um, so these are, so spectrum is pluggable uh, mostly. I'm, I'm hoping you don't need to plug into the type system much, but uh, trying to make the power available there. Um, so a transformer is a hook into the checking process for a specific function. So if, you, if you're checking a namespace and you have you know, 10 calls to map, you're gonna get called 10 times uh, once with the exact arguments to that specific call. So you get the original spec and then you go, your job is to return an updated spec and you can do all kinds of fun things here. So in this case, in our map example, we can look at the type of the function they passed in and they'll look at the type of the collection and then say, okay, well based on the output of the mapping function, the output of the map has to be a collection of the, of the return thing. And then the, based on the input of the mapping function, the collections all have to be this type. And then you know, if you get past you know, three, three sequences, you can say, oh, well the function needs to take three arguments now. Um, and this is done during the flow step, so then that means that the checking will just work automatically. Uh, and this is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so we can check the type of this, and it says it is a collection of class long. Uh, the reason for that is if you pass, the reason it says class long there is uh, ink is polymorphic, so if you pass it a long, you get back a long. If you pass it a double, you get back a double. So in this case, it knows uh, range returns a collection of ints. I passed an int to ink, so I get a long. Uh, another cool thing it can do is uh, branch prediction. So we have this function, you know, maybe ink. So it takes, a, it takes an argument that is maybe nil or maybe an int, and then returns maybe nil, maybe an int. And so on this ink here, um, if you pass int or null to that, that would be, that would be a type error, right? Because you're, you're not allowed to ink null. So when we go through the if statement, the if says um, if x. So you know if we put on our you know closure uh, interpreter in our head, that would say in the then statement x is true or x is truthy, and in the else statement x is falsy. So so this already works. Um, it will update the types on the then and else branches, and it will also recognize. Uh, It'll also recognize predicates, you know, so like if you had if int or if string or whatever that, it, it handles that right now. Uh, so earlier in the hallway, Gary asked for a slide on edge cases, so where is Gary? There we go. Uh, so let's talk about even, you know, so even is a closure function. Uh, you can use it as a predicate. So how do we, you know, how do we handle the case of can I pass an even to an int? Uh, well, it turns out if you look at the uh, uh, if you look, you know, even the, even the function only accepts integers. So then you can look at the definition of the integer function to see what else can it take. Uh, so then we know that just for free, we know that if a thing is even, it also, I can also pass it to any, and I can also pass, it'll, it'll work anywhere I can pass any, and it'll work anywhere I can pass integer. Uh, and then for the closure implementation, I had to do some extra magic to say, you know, there, there are things that are true in Clojure that don't appear in .clj files, so you have to go digging around in the, in the .java files. And so if a thing passes integer, that means it is, it could be any one of these Java Lang classes. You know, it could be Java Lang int long whatever. So uh, I don't expect you'll need to do much of this uh, and instance or so I'm not gonna talk about it because I, I expect that's only gonna be limited to the Closure Core, uh, dealing with things in Closure Core. User code shouldn't have to mess with that. Uh, dealing with covariance. So this was 
a real thing that I had to deal with, or am still dealing with. Uh, this, this code is in progress, but I'm pretty sure I can make it work. So the output of Tools Analyzer JVM, that's this ANA JVM analysis thing. You know, it's a big, it's that big nested map, and I have, I have a big nested, uh, I have a big spec for that. And then, so that's in the first step of the, of the, the flow process. And then after I go through flow, it's like, well, it's an analysis, but then it should also have this return spec. But then you have these functions that say, oh, I passed in an, uh, a tools analyzer analysis, and I get out a tools analyzer analysis. But if you look at the source code, this actually doesn't care whether it gets, which kind of analysis it gets. It's, if this key is here, I, you know, I, I deref the key and you get the thing. Um, so it turns out without covariance, this is uh, not very useful because it, it basically without this, it would uh, implicitly downcast your functions, you know, because I passed in a flow analysis, but then it says I'm returning a uh, tools analyzer analysis and that doesn't have these keys. Uh, so the, the way to fix that is to do the flow again with the new arguments, you know, so when we did the original flow process, like with ink x that we saw, you know, we say, oh, the first argument is an int. Well, in this case, you know, the first argument is a, tool, is a tools analyzer, and then we'll run it again with a flow and analysis and see if the return value is different. And if the return value is different, then you can use it. Um, so understanding spec, uh, this doesn't work yet, but it should be very easy to write. You know, so this is the problem that everybody, everybody ever has complained about. You know, I get a random thing off the wire. You know, the user posted me some arbitrary code. You know, what is it? And how do I, how do I pass that into my clean, well-typed code? Well, the answer, so, you know, here we have the JSON read string, and then I wanna say, if that's valid data, then call, call stuff that uses it. Um, Spectrum can very easily be modified to understand this. You know, because we already do branch prediction, we already understand uh, other predicates. So if you have any, any closure core predicate, and actually any predicate that's used in, a, in types, that'll work now. But it doesn't currently understand you know, S valid and S conform, but that's an hour patch. So getting close to the end of this, uh, what's the awesome about this? Uh, types equals code equals data is amazing. Um, most other type systems will start with a much more limited type system. Um, I didn't have that flexibility because, you know, I don't control spec. And, but the important part there is, so spec is just arbitrary closure code. So now I'm using arbitrary closure as types. Uh, I'm sure the, I'm sure the academic programming language people will tell me this is, you know, a complete nightmare and you can't prove anything. Um, they're probably right about you can't prove 100% of things, but you can prove a quite a bit of production code, and that's useful to me. You know, so I'm sure there are going to be, I'm sure there are going to be things that are true that, I mean, it's already the case that we deal with code that is true that you can't prove. And now I'm, that limitation will also apply to the type checker, but I'm okay with that. Um, this also introduces dependent types. So that's types where the, um, where you can have data as part of your type. So for example, a standard, you know, the, the 101 example of this is I have a list of length 10, you know, so now length 10 is now a part of your type. So then you can do things like this function takes a non-empty collection or this function takes a collection and returns a, another collection of the same size. Uh, this is incredibly powerful. And this isn't just limited to spectrum. Like, this is a thing you can do with spec today, I think. And it'd be really, that'd be a really cool talk next year of, you know, all of the crazy types you can come up, uh, not types, but like constraints you can come up with in spec that are actually useful. You know, so you can say, did this function, you know, so like sort. It's really important that your function returns a list of the same size. Um, so going forward, I wanna say don't, we shouldn't fear static analysis. You know, there's this static, you know, Static typing is the boogeyman kind of uh, impression in the community sometimes, and I think that's overblown. Uh, there's all kinds of fun things we can build with Tools Analyzer. You know, does this function throw? Does it scale? You know, is it, 
Is it fast? Uh, is it pure? Is it refer referentially transparent? You know, Rich's talk yesterday about, you know, what are the dependencies for this function? It's like, we can, we can start proving that. We can say this function is pure and it doesn't depend on anything else, so, you know, if I really wanted to, I could copy the implementation into my, not copy, but I mean, like, I can use this implementation as is, and then if some other part of the app uses a different version of that function, it's totally fine, because we've proven that the two don't interact. Um, and then there's, like, initialization kind of things. You know, is foo only ever after called after bar? You know, like, you always, basically, I think, when you, when you read the doc strings about, you know, only do this after that, those are usually areas where we can probably do better as programmers in terms of, you know, constraints, because I'm gonna try to avoid using static typing as the boogeyman. So yeah, um, so optional static typing can be effective. It's not appropriate in all projects all, all the time. It's not effective in 100% of your project, but it can be useful in some areas. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know what the term is for using closure data and functions as types, but it's very cool. So yeah, um, thanks to everybody who did worked on spec and tools analyzer. I think we have time for questions.